I just wanted to say a quick welcome and uh, thank you for AARP and the BBA for putting on tonight's candidate. I think these types of forums are very important and the Y is happy to host this and to welcome you all here tonight. Uh, wish everyone well. And uh, we always like to emphasize, whether it's our staff in our decision making or uh, our youth in our programs or our members, the Y core values, which we conveniently put up above here, which is caring, honesty, respect, and responsibility. We think that's always helpful to keep in mind. And again, good luck to all the candidates tonight. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. Well, welcome. Good evening. My name is Linda Bowden. I'm the volunteer state president for AARP. And we're thrilled to see so many of you folks here tonight. Tonight, we're hoping to get to know our Burlington City Council candidates just a little bit better. These candidates are vying for, to represent voters like you in wards one and eight. The livability of our communities has long been a focus of our work at AARP Vermont. How our cities and towns prepare for and accommodate an aging population has a profound effect on the health of our community and the quality of life today and in the future for residents of all ages. We hope to explore a number of critical issues tonight, including transportation, housing, job growth and mobility, and give you the opportunity to answer and to ask your questions as well. We are fortunate tonight to partner with the Burlington Business Association, who shares our commitment to educating voters like you on how these candidates stand on important livability issues before you all go to the polls in March. We encourage you to ask questions of the candidates by filling out an index card, which you might have seen at the table when you entered. Right in the back, Phil has got those, those index cards. He's raising his hand. So please feel free to pick one of those up. Put your name on there as well as your question and we will come around and pick up those questions and select as many as we can to cover tonight. Our moderator tonight is Marcus Serta, right back there. He is in charge tonight, folks. He will ask the questions of the candidates and manage the format. He will go over the details with you in just a moment. Tonight's event is meant to be an educational forum. Now I've got my teacher hat on. We ask audience members to please respect the spirit of this event, as well as our candidates and our audience members, and refrain from any rallying, heckling, or loud cheering, please. We want to use our time efficiently and promise to get as many questions answered as possible. You're invited to join us for a reception after our forum where there are going to be lots of yummy desserts. Before I go further, I would like to give a shout out to the volunteers that are working here tonight. Can we please have a round of applause for all those folks <laughs> donating their time? Thank you. For those of you who do not know us well, advocating for older Vermonters and livable communities is just one part of what AARP does in Vermont. In addition to our local advocacy and education work, we are engaging with lawmakers at the State House on a host of issues important to older Vermonters. In addition, we work at the federal level on issues like prescription drugs, social security, and older worker protections, to name just a few. We are assisted in our efforts by teams of volunteers, and you may have seen them out in the community doing tax aid, driver safety, livable communities, advocacy, and of course, fraud. So please join us if you'd like, or find out about being a volunteer with AARP. You can see me after the event. Otherwise, Marcus, let's get going with the program. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to first say thank you to uh, Kelly and Kelly from uh, AARP Vermont and uh, the Burlington Business Association for putting me in charge tonight. Please don't tell my wife. All right. 
Uh, the candidates that you see before you uh, on town meeting day will be on your ballots and it's going to be very important to be able to hear what they have to say. So again, I would please ask that we refrain from any heckling outbursts or any other type of noises because we want to get through the questions and we, about, we want to be able to hear their responses. Elections are very important. We want to make sure that the electorate is duly informed. Um, each one of the candidates will have 60 seconds to respond to each question. They do have the opportunity for rebuttals. Rebuttals are 30 seconds. Uh, there is a timekeeper. Our good, good man Bob up here up front is going to be keeping time and letting them know when their time is up. Uh, I do also have the opportunity for to ask follow-up questions at my discretion. Uh, candidates will have 30 seconds to answer those questions. Uh, again, you have the opportunity to also answer, ask questions of the candidates. So at any time, feel free to get an index card from the back table and fill out one of those cards and we'll get those questions hopefully answered tonight. All right, everybody ready? All right, this, there are no opening statements tonight. There is an opening question. The candidates were prepared for this particular question. So we will start uh, with Adam Roof who will answer this question first. Like the rest of the state, Burlington's population is aging. According to the US Census Bureau, over the next decade and beyond, the percentage of people 65 and older will grow more than any other age demographic. Right behind older adults are people in their 20s. How can our city grow, develop, and redevelop in a way that addresses the needs and desires of these two demographics? Name two changes you would support to address their needs, such as housing. All right, can everyone hear me? This is the first time we're doing, okay, everyone seems to be nodding. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, when thinking about this question, I'm glad that it calls out the biggest challenge that we have, not just here in Burlington, but statewide, which is our demographic challenge. Um, because that really is a, an existential economic and community crisis that is playing out, like I said, not just here in Burlington, but even more so in other parts of rural Vermont. Um, but here's, th that's the challenge, but I see the opportunity is I see the opportunity as rather um, that older folks, older Burlingtonians and younger folks here in Burlington, their needs are demonstrably the same. They're looking for a place to live affordably, to, to play, work, learn, exercise as we have people running above us. Um, and that's what we need to be focused on here in Burlington is that their needs are the same. And so the question specifically about what two things I would do, um, you know, I would provide drastic amounts of increased housing uh, in the downtown and in our major corridors, uh, the densest parts of our town, um, affordable housing. Adam, that's going to, sorry, your time's up. I got to keep. I think I had five more seconds, but the second would be to uh, invest in workforce development. Thank you. I'm sorry about that, but we're trying to keep to the time so that, again, we could try to get through as many questions as possible. And uh, I did forget to introduce each one of the candidates, so let me take a moment to do that now. Adam Roof is a Democrat running the, as an incumbent right now. He's currently on the City Council for Ward 8. Uh, next to him is Jane Stromberg. She, has the, she is a progressive uh, looking for your vote for Ward 8. Um, then we have Zariah Hightower, progressive for Ward 1. She is uh, looking for your vote this, this uh, town meeting day. Sharon Busher, who is the incumbent and independent for Ward 1. And then we have Jillian, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this right, Scannell. Uh, she's Democrat, looking for your vote for Ward 1. All right. Carrying on, Jane, if you don't mind, if, do you need me to re-ask the question? No, it's okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, my name is Jane Stromberg. I know I'm a newcomer amongst you, so I just wanted to say hello. Um, but in, uh, in regards to this important question, I think we need to focus on balanced housing here in Burlington. Um, we have uh, long-term residents and we have renters and I've talked to a lot of long-term residents that say, you know, they get new neighbors every single year and I can see how that can be stressful and, um, you know, not very conducive to building community. So I think that we need to focus on holding UVM accountable to creating more um, housing on campus and more affordable housing um, as well as holding our landlords accountable downtown, um, you know, I, 
if people have accountable landlords and uh, our tenants are being well taken care of, they're more um, you know, inspired to take care of the space that they're living in, the property that they're uh, taking care of, and I think that that's awesome for everyone here in Burlington. Thanks, Jane. Zariah. Great. So if you know me, I'm always going to talk about housing and transit, and that does not matter what age you're a part of. Um, so on housing, I've talked to people who are afraid that they're going to lose their housing because of the growing tax base. I've talked to people who can't stay in Vermont because the entry wage salaries aren't the same as our incredibly high renter costs. And so to me, it's absolutely revitalizing our housing. Our housing is not reflective of our population. We need smaller homes for seniors. We need smaller homes for smaller families. And um, I think that there's a lot that we can do to do that. Um, I think that revitalizing our housing, having more housing, allowing our population to grow when it wants to grow so that students can stay here, allowing our housing to grow uh, so that seniors don't necessarily have to move into senior housing but can stay in independent living situations that they want. Um, is absolutely important. Then transit, of course, we need to make a transit system that's accessible to all. Millennials don't want cars. Seniors often can't drive, so it needs to be more accessible. Thank you, Zariah. Sharon. Thank you. Um, as is said, um, there's more in common with these two age groups than is different, so I'll get right to it. As far as housing, I think that that is one of the issues, and accessibility to services. So for housing, I think that we need to, um, we've sponsored a, a proposal for accessory dwelling units that allows to create more housing and allows people to age in place. Um, on more on-campus housing, inclusionary zoning deals with some of the affordability, and City Place should create workforce housing. As far as accessibility, it means pedestrian accessibility, all multimodal ways of getting around in the community so you get all your needs met, health care, food, et cetera. We've got the intervale. We've got all of so you can live, work, and stay in Burlington, and, and we can sustain ourselves. Thank you, Sharon. Jillian. Hey there. Um, so I'm one of those folks on the other end of the spectrum, one of the 20-somethings who happened to come to this town, fall in love with it, and, and now I want to stay, and I'm having a little bit of trouble doing so, and that's because of the housing crisis that we're facing. Um, and I think that we need all actors to step up in Burlington, um, and so we can see more affordable housing and also a, a higher vacancy rate in the city. Um, and I think the way forward to do that um, is that the University of Vermont build more on-campus housing for students. Um, that will relieve some of the pressure um, on the housing market for the city. Um, and I think I am in a unique position to do that. Um, I'm currently the student body president at UVM. Um, so I have a lot of um, relationships built with folks on campus. Um, and with the forthcoming um, agreement, housing agreement between the city and the university, I think I can be a valuable voice in the room to facilitate those conversations so we can see action taken. Thank you, Jillian. Moving on to land use and development, here's a question, and Jane, you will be the first one to answer this question. Are there policy changes that you feel are necessary to address the downtown mall project, otherwise known as City Place, to ensure its completion? Would you mind repeating that? Sure. Are there any policy changes that you feel are necessary to address the downtown mall project, City Place, to ensure its completion? Sorry, I had to think about that for a second. Um, so I think that we're not doing the groundwork and the outreach necessary to bring all voices into our decision-making process in the city. And the city place and a lot of the downtown development is kind of happening under the auspices of uh, uh, leaning towards privatization. And I think that we need to keep our assets public in the city, and we need to um, seriously um, attend to the fact that we are, you know, we're, we're in, a very unique position to bring in more and more voices and do that groundwork here. And I think that that kind of um, 
slowness that we're seeing, that delayed process we're seeing in the city hall place, I mean city place and a lot of the development downtown is a product of not having a good plan in the first place. Thank you, Jane. Zariah. Um, I'm not aware of any policy changes that are necessary. I think it's more a question of how we implement projects once we decide to do them. I think it's a question of are we, you know, to change points, listening to all the voices in the room, and then if there's dissenting voices, are we pushing something through without putting enough accountability and that kind of legal backbone that we need to really enforce um, what we are, what agreements that we're putting in place. And so um, I'm not sure that there need to be policy changes. I think that the redesign will hopefully be much, much closer to what the population wanted to see in the first place. I think we could have negotiated that to uh, begin with, um, seeing as maybe it didn't need to be so large um, in order to accommodate profitability, since now the profitability will be done on a smaller basis. So no, I think it needs to be done. Um, the way that we as a community negotiate with outside partners needs to change. Thank you, Zariah. Sharon. Thank you. I, I concur. I don't believe that there really are any policy changes that need to occur, but we do have a development agreement with the, um, so this is a private entity, and so we have a public-private venture for the streets, but we, but the it's private, and so the developer really controls that site. What we have is the agreement, and we've tried to hold that, the developer, accountable, and we've taken action when appropriate. Um, I think that, 30 seconds, okay. I was one person who voted against the original project because I thought the size and the scale were inappropriate. Actually, what is being proposed is very much what I tried to get the rest of the council to agree to. Um, I spent my whole summer working on redesigning that project and trying to get the developer to go along with that because it was more in keeping with what Burlington needed. Still the same three components, but just smaller and more compatible with us. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Jillian. As Sharon mentioned, this uh, development is now privately owned by Brookfield, um, and so the power that we have in to policies and create over it is a little bit more limited. Um, I think any policy needs to prioritize uh, making progress on the site so it no longer is a pit. Um, but what we can do is we can Brookfield accountable um, when it comes to that de development agreement and there will be in changes to it and edits to it. We need to ensure that there's commitment to public engagement and sharing progress on the po project. Um, we, my mic is really loud. <laughs> we need to commit to um, making sure that there are progress measures, so if something's not met and the uh, performance measure is not met, what does the city get back? So we're not, we're not losing anything from that. And then ensuring that there's a commitment around the construction schedule. Um, I think that with a lot more communication, both with people in City Hall and with constituents, I think a lot we would have a better idea what was going on if they were held accountable to telling us what was going on. Thank you, Jillian. Adam. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, you know, this is, you know, it's important, I think it's been mentioned, sort of this gets wrapped up into the, you know, is the city of Burlington privatizing assets? And let's just be very, very clear about this, is the city does not own this property. And if it did, we'd have a lot more control over the development and as it, and as it progressed. In fact, you know, if you want to talk about privatization, we actually got back from this property two streets, which will be publicly owned and managed, which I think is an important piece, if not the most, one of the most critical pieces. Uh, also, the development agreement that's in place now that was negotiated years ago did, protect, did do its job. It appropriately protected the city in this delayed situation. No taxpayer dollars, for example, or not substantial taxpayer dollars have been at risk during this process. So the development agreement does need to be our carrot and our stick because that is how we can have control or somewhat control over private property in this city. Uh, and again, we need to be focused on what it's going to take to move this project forward because we are not going back to the days of a dead mall in the middle of our downtown. We're in a better place than we are now than where we were then and I'm looking forward to supporting the project going forward. Thank you, Adam. Governance and taxes. On this year's town meeting day ballot, voters are going to see two questions asking for their approval to increase taxes. These are proposed a proposed increase of the housing trust fund assessment to a full pen, uh, to a full penny as well as a 3 cent increase for the public safety tax rate in the public safety tax rate. 
What are your views on these tax increases, which are likely to result in higher housing costs? How would you address the concerns of older and younger citizens who are already say they cannot afford a living costs in Burlington? This question will start with Zariah. Um, I absolutely agree that this will increase um, housing taxes. I do, and obviously, there's, that's a hard issue in Burlington. Um, I think both of these are important issues, specifically to me, CHT. I do think we have an obligation as a community, and I know it's hard to ask, given um, you know what the current tax rates are, which I understand. I'm also a homeowner in Burlington. Um, we do have an obligation to make it more affordable to others. So Champlain Housing Trust is a huge part of that. The increase to a penny tax will make housing more affordable in Burlington for other participants, and I think that's extremely important. The other one, the public safety tax, it's not a uh, huge tax. I think it's an important part of um, keeping all members of the public, uh, you know, accessible to emergency services. So that's absolutely something that we have to do. I think we have to expand the tax base in Burlington. We can't say we're not going to improve public services. That's something that we're going to have to continue to do. It's extremely important. If anything, we just need to have more housing, have some infill, so we've got a growing tax base to cover those rising costs. Thank you, Zariah. Sharon. Could you actually read that question again? Certainly. I apologize, but I just want to make sure. On the town meeting day ballot, voters are going to see two questions asking for their approval to increase taxes. These are proposed a proposed increase of the housing trust fund assessment to a full penny, as well as a three cent increase in the public safety tax rate. What are your views on these tax increases, which will likely result in higher housing costs? And how could you address the concerns of older and younger citizens in Burlington who already say they cannot afford the cost of living? So I, my job is to evaluate whether or not the need is real for these taxes or these increases and then put that forward to all of you to make your own determination on it. I feel the Housing Trust Fund, we already have a half a penny and we've been fully funding it at a penny. So this is formalizing what we are doing currently. That is used to generate millions of dollars for affordable. So it's seed money. So look at that as an investment and it it mushrooms into far more dollars. As far as the public safety tax, that's three cents. That's $81.92 per 100,000. So for around a $200,000 home, it's $163,245. Um, $163, um, once again, for ambulance service and other public issues, um, I think they're needed. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Jillian. I think it's interesting that a lot of us on this stage are, you know, advocating for both of these increase in taxes and saying that this is important because housing and public safety, safety are by far the two most important things. Um, in regard to the housing trust fund, there's no one sil silver bullet to solving the uh, affordable housing crisis in Burlington, but this is one of the tools in our toolbox to do so. Um, so I think giving to this, um, like has been said, I think giving to this um, and approving this um, is important to have more money to build more affordable housing. I mean, in, in regards to the public safety increase, I 100% support it. Um, it's a one-time increase, so I do understand the concerns around um, housing taxes and, and prices. And as counselor, you know, about 70% of your housing taxes go to the schools, and that's for the schools to deal with. But I, I do say, as counselor, that I, I wanna I wanna help keep the other percent that I can control, and I wanna help make sure that it, it's what we want, and that and that we can keep it low. Thank you, Jillian. Adam. Uh, the question about my, uh, my views, my views on these two taxes are that they are necessary, but they are feeding this central conundrum that we are dealing with here in Burlington, that we are expanding the cost of providing critical services, both affordable housing and public safety in this case, while not expanding our, the number of people who are paying for it. It's like going out to dinner with four people, and the, you put the check four ways, and if you go out with six people, and the, the bill's a little bit more affordable. That's what we talk, that when we talk about expanding our tax base, that's essentially what we're talking about. Um, 
more specifically on the public safety tax, I think this is really important to recognize. This is a lean budget. This is a, not a bloated tax increase that we are requesting. This is going to add a new ambulance to our city and nine new firefighters to our community. That is absolutely, we have an amazing team at the fire department and bringing nine new people on board to be a part of that team is a good thing. Uh, the Board of Finance did its due diligence as did the full council. This is not frivolous spending. And the housing trust fund, as we talk about all the time, is critical because of the need for increased affordable housing. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. Talking about transportation and mobility for a moment, and uh, this question will start with Sharon for an answer. Um, what is your strategy to make transit a practical daily option for a wide range of Burlingtonians and to ensure it... Excuse me. Oh, hey. I'm sorry. <laughs> My apologies. Thank you. I'm obviously not in charge. No. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Jane. Okay, back to the tax increases. Uh, sorry, folks. Um, well, I think that taxes are, you know, they're already burdensome for the average Vermonter, especially Burlingtonian. Um, so I'm not an advocate for tax increases in general in the way that we have it. But um, for these particular items, of course, I'm supportive of increasing our uh, our tax um, increase. Did you say five seconds? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so I think that we have a very regressive taxation system here in the city, and we need to find more progressive ways to form revenue. I can give you a couple more seconds if you want. I think we. I think there was a thought. There was a rebuttal. So I just want to make sure that. Did you? <laughs> oh, he thought I was rebutting, okay. so, uh, all right, I'm going to keep right. going. <laughs> Sorry, Bob. See, Sorry. again, not in charge. <laughs> all right, well, long story short, we need to bring large institutions into the taxation process in this city, uh, such as the hospital and UVM. These monstrous organizations on top of the hill, um, you know, should have some kind of involvement with our, our taxation process, and I think that... Um, you know, we shouldn't be shifting the burden onto, uh, you know, people like you and I in this city. I, I don't know about the numbers of population, if that should matter or not. It really comes down to where we're getting that revenue and how we can make this a progressive system rather than a regressive taxation system. All right, Jane, thank you so much. I'm sorry for, sorry for skipping you. I'll, I'll make sure I'm on top of it in the future. Um, Adam, you wanted to use a rebuttal at this time, so I'll give you 30 seconds. Yeah, I, you know, I think that you know, we need to be looking at different ways to expand our tax base, but I think we also need to be realistic about the powers that a city council has, because we're running for city council, not for governor, not for state senate. Uh, the, the thought that we would be able to somehow tax nonprofits at a, at a rate that's going to fix our tax issue is, is unrealistic. We have payment in lieu of taxes that we need to be pursuing, I think, more aggressively. But when we talk about expanding our tax base and having institutions be a part of the affordability issues in town, we have to be realistic about what the powers that we have are. All right. Thank you, Adam. Jane, you were going, you want to use a rebuttal? All right. Jane is going to use 30 seconds for a rebuttal. Well, I think that a UVM, uh, you know, and all large institutions in the city, um, they don't pay the same type of taxes that we pay. Um, and I think that that needs to change. And I think participatory uh, budgeting in general should be more of a reality for us. And it should be more of an inclusive system in terms of where we are allocating our money and getting um, our tax revenue. Jane, let me ask a follow-up to that because... I guess I, I need a little bit more clarity about how you would you would exactly what kind of policy you would create in order to create this fair taxation you're talking about for these organizations. Well, I think that you know this kind of goes back to the time of Bernie and Clavel with their franchise fee. Um, that was a very progressive idea for their time, and I think we should do something like that. Even though we do have that kind of in practice as is, it can be a lot stronger, and especially in times like you know 2020 is a lot different than the 1980s. So I think that we should instate some type of system like that that's a lot stronger and really does actually bring in UVM. Just because it's a nonprofit doesn't mean that there are not entities uh, associated with that university that can help us out. All right. Thank you, Jane. Okay. Uh, so 
Sharon, this question is for you, and we'll start with you for talking about transportation again. What is strategy, what is your strategy to make transit a practical daily option for a wide range of Burlingtonians and ensuring that they, it will be accessible to everyone? Is that better? Okay. So we have wanted to have better public transportation, but the hurdle has been we don't have the ridership. And so actually I've been trying to work with CATMA and way to go to try to figure out how to increase ridership. A couple of years ago they abandoned um, their, uh, they had every year one day where everyone could ride the bus for free and leave their car at home. And so my thought was, let's expand that. Let's go to having them initially do it once a month and then have them do it twice a month and then have them do it once a week. Like every Tuesday you put out your recycling, you leave your car at home and you take the bus. It would increase ridership and ultimately it would potentially make it more affordable. We need to find another way to fund it. If you say you want free busing, that means somebody has to pay for it. So we need an alternative source to fund that to either offer reduced fees or free busing. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Jillian. For me, part of city councilor means uh, working in partnership to fi try to find solutions that are going to address the needs of our community. And so I've been speaking to some possible shareholders, and I, I think that moving towards the idea of a regional intermodal transit facility um, between UVM, South Burlington, the city of Burlington, the medical center, and really bringing everybody to the table for this uh, intermodal transit facility um, would decrease our reliance on cars. So it stops cars um, that are going into the city, um, and it would allow more opportunity um, for people to take uh, public transit. Um, and I think that it's a good, a good option to sort of hit on multiple issues, both addressing issues with the emissions caused by m more and more cars coming into the city, but also making it more accessible and, and pushing public transit to, to become easier for more folks. Thank you, Jillian. Adam. Um, you know, in order to make this a reality, because we talk about transportation a lot, um, we heard a lot about, about it at the state level and the national level, we need, at the local level, we need to do three things. We, we, need to, we need more options, we have to market it better, and we need a way to pay for it. Um, when it comes to more options, it, we hear it a lot, we need low or no fare buses, more electric buses, we need better sidewalks, we need more bike lanes and car share programs at every chance that we can get. We also need to market it a little bit better. I, was, I had the opportunity to help announce the, the uh, bringing two new electric buses to Burlington that will run on the red line, which cuts through Ward 8. And there's a lot of excitement about electric buses. We have to capitalize on that excitement and get people more interested. Lastly, we need to pay for it. And I'm the only candidate that has brought forward a way to pay for sustainable transportation without going to the tax base. It's called my plus one for climate action, and it adds one dollar to every paid ticket to uh, concerts and events on the waterfront, which will generate tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, which over time can pay for these sorts of things that we talk a lot about without any actual plan to pay for. Thank you, Adam. Jane. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that we have a decade to cut our global emissions in half, or we face the catastrophic effects of a 1.5 degrees Celsius increase as a globe. What that means to me is that those two buses, that's great. That's a great start. But we have 10 years. And the city of Burlington has a net zero energy plan uh, to be net zero energy by 2030, which is great. But as a globe, this, it's not matching up. So we need to take that seriously. And we need to actually focus on making public transit free for everybody. We have a $193 million budget as a city. It's two, about 2.5 to $3 million to make it free for everyone in Burlington to use public transportation, which will incentivize the usage of that. And we want to work together to electrify that as well. And uh, I sat on the board of VPIRG, and um, I have a lot of um, coalition building experience in Montpelier, and I think Thank that you, we can make this work. Appreciate it. Um, Adam, did you want to use a rebuttal? I see it hot in your hand. I don't want to use it, but I, but I, I think I have to because we don't have a 192 or $3 million budget. We have an, 
about an $80 million municipal budget, which the city council gets to mostly control. We also have enterprise funds, uh, which are things like the airport or BED, and I do think that BED needs to be a critical partner in, in doing this. And just to be clear, these, these two buses, they cost a million bucks each, and it took a state and federal and local partners and nonprofit and other community partners in order just to bring two. So I think that pie in the sky uh, words without hardcore plans, I think, are just as dangerous as anything else that we're facing today. Jane, you want to use your rebuttal? All right, go ahead. So yeah, the general fund um, has about $75 million, and BED is the next largest chunk, which is a huge uh, opportunity for us. Um, and I think that this doesn't come down to like how much we budgeted as a city. It comes down to our coalitions with the state of Vermont. And it comes down to, are we willing to actually push for this as a council and put pressure on the state and um, you know our friends? So as a follow-up, let me just, so that I'm clear, it looks like what you're suggesting is that to pay for the policies that, are, that you're pushing for, you would be asking the state to put down the money for that? For electrifying the buses and all public transportation, because quite frankly, I think we can afford to make it free for everybody as a city. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Zariah. Great, yeah, this is obviously an issue that I care about a lot in terms of free busing, how we pay for it, and so on. Um, I don't think it's a marketing problem having lived in a lot of cities that have good bus systems. You use them because they're convenient, not because they're marketed a lot. So making sure that we're uh, just making it, making it competitive with walking and so on in terms of time, having more routes, having them run more quick, frequently makes people use the bus. In terms of how you pay for it, I think there's lots of ways you pay for it. The ridership doesn't pay for the buses. Like, it doesn't do it now. It's not going to do it when it's free. It's, that's an acceptable thing to do. If the city can subsidize, and I, let's have a hard conversation about parking. If the city can subsidize uh, on-street parking, then they can also subsidize bus ridership, or they could replace one for the other, which I would be an advocate of. Thank you, Zariah. All right, I've got some questions here from the Neighborhood Planning Commission, so uh, a couple of questions for you, and uh, we'll, Jillian, you'll get to answer this first. Uh, enforcement of some city regulations aren't fully enforced, such as lot coverage used for parking um, for unrelated adults sharing a residence. How would you improve the enforcement process and are current penalties sufficient and appropriate? Thank you. Uh, those are two really important issues. Um, I, I think that when it comes down when we're creating policies around zoning and any ordinances, a policy is really only as productive as how we can enforce it and how that works. Um, when it comes to zoning laws and even enforcement when we're talking about rentals, I think that our code enforcement office is doing amazing work. That being said, I think that they're stretched very thin. Um, so I think that we need to provide more support there. Um, and in regards to the, the four um, unrelated um, folks all living in the same spot and, and what the rule, rules are along that, um, I think that there's a lot of complexities to that ordinance and some things where there are grandfathered in rules and, and just some things that are very not are unclear and its applicability to the average, whether it's the renter or the landlord, um, doesn't quite make sense. So I think that we need to clarify exactly what that ordinance means and how we're enforcing it. Thank you, Jillian. Adam. Yeah, I think, um, of course, there, in, in every community uh, in our country, we have ordinances or rules that from time to time aren't enforced, and that's frustrating. Uh, it can be anything from uh, zoning or jaywalking. I think I jaywalked on the way here. Um, you know, th we need to be realistic about how we invest in the departments that are responsible for enforcement. And so I'll go back to, we used to call it code enforcement, now we call it permitting and inspections. Bill Ward, who's an amazing public servant and his team do amazing work, uh, but they are only so few. Uh, that coupled with you know, competing state laws and, and federal laws around property rights and like this foreign related issue that we talk so much about, which I do think is critical for uh, for our neighborhoods, um, it's hard to enforce. You have people going in and counting uh, toothbrushes or bedrooms or trying to figure out how many people are on a lease. Um, we need to invest more in our team. 
and through that we can we can do a better job enforcing what's on the books. I'll just add that I was you know, last year I did push for new regu uh, new uh, zoning rules, for example, to ban uh, lawn street uh, parking on lawns here in, in Ward 8. Which so we do need more policies right. as well. Thank you, Adam. Jane. I did touch on this in the beginning, but I'll add to it. Um, holding our landlords accountable and really putting an emphasis on landlord licensing. Um, this would definitely decrease the amount of um, you know, garbage and, and furniture and things like that. I've talked to a lot of folks who um, felt very strongly about those things being out on the street, and that's totally valid. Like that, It shouldn't be, but um, I mean, those things shouldn't be out on the street. But so landlord licensing and rent control. If we have rent control, um, people wouldn't feel like they need to pack into a house um, at, at such rates, like six or seven plus people. Um, it's not ideal. Like No one really wants to live with that many people. Um, but it comes right back down to affordability and you know what the price versus the quality of what you're getting and the square footage that you're getting. So I think we have to have a realistic talk uh, sorry, realistic talk about uh, landlord licensing, making sure that they have benchmarks to me and rent control. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Zariah. If we're looking at our housing stock and trying to keep it intact, we're losing. Like, Burlington is losing the battle of keeping quality housing as it is. And so we can't depend on enforcement. That's the route that we've been trying to go for decades and it's not working. We need a better avenue. To me, that's improving tenant protections, improving tenant rights, giving them the right to call the landlords themselves if the landlord's the problem. But don't put the onus on the tenants. Why are we counting toothbrushes? Is that like a real, as someone who sits on the development review board, it is extremely invasive when you go into somebody's house and try to say how many people live there. Not saying I would get rid of it without having other protections in place. That's important to say. It is protecting some of our neighborhoods, but it is not doing it enough, and it's putting the onus on the wrong people, the tenants, instead of the landlords. Thank you, Zariah. Sharon. Thank you. Um, no, the issue around um, lot coverage and for unrelated, our system currently depends on neighbors reporting. There's no real way of, of um, verifying that what is submitted on the, on the registration form annually is actually what's either in the yard or, or in the house. And I think that really what we need is to have some sort of audit, sp sporadic audit just to verify. To, uh, to hold people accountable for what they, first of all, submit to the city. I've also, coming on next Tuesday, um, I've asked, um, I've worked with another counselor um, to have that property owners give a map for their tenants so they know where they can park, and that map would be submitted at the time of registration, and then code would have that map, and it would be easier to uh, have people comply and hold them accountable. Thank you, Sharon. Zarai, you want to use your rebuttal? Yeah. All right. 30 seconds. Uh, fiercely against the idea of an audit. Um, I think that in some cases, such as green space, fine, absolutely do it, fan of it. In other places, I know where there are, there's a house of six black men in our ward that are illegally living without their landlord knowing it in one home. Are you gonna audit them and tell them that they can't live there? Is that really the city that we wanna live in? Is the one that's going around auditing members of our community and telling them to move out? That's not the community I wanna live in. Thank you, Zariah. Sharon, you wanna rebut? Okay. I would take issue with the example used because it suggests that there's a bias. An audit is done randomly to just see if compliance is met. And I think that, I really do believe that if indeed you're not, I understand that the renter is oftentimes the victim here, but the landlord is responsible for following the rules of, of our ordinances and laws in the city. And so I really believe that that is one way to hold the landlord accountable and therefore hold, um, not have too many people Thank you, Sharon. Zariah, you wanted to rebut again? <laughs> okay. Just want to point out there is a bias. Um, the, 
the people who are doing it against their landlord's wishes, who you'd also be auditing, they're most likely to be low income, they're most likely to be minorities. There is a systemic bias that is in play here. If you're doing a blanket audit, even if it is everyone, there is a bias that's involved in that. Sharon, go ahead. I'll give you 30 seconds, please. Sorry. Uh, um, with the foreign related, there is a functional family component, and most of the people that um, that are that live in Ward One. That when I go knocking on their doors, um, there may be far more than four people living there, but they function as a family, even though they may not be related. And often they are minorities or people, new Americans coming here. Um, and so I, I don't agree with the comments made. Thank you. All right, sir. 30 seconds. Using my last rebuttal on this, if there weren't a fee to apply for a functional family that you had to re-pay for every single time somebody in your member changed, then I would not be against this. But there is a fee that you do have to pay to become a functional family. All right. Moving on, we got another question from the Neighborhood Planning Commission. Um, and again, for those of you who are incumbents, please take this this question into account might be slightly different for you as, as it is for those who are running against you. How much time do you have to devote to council work? What experience do you have on boards and commissions? And how many council meetings have you attended? So please take that in stride if you're an incumbent <laughs> and for those running against, please. But uh, please, uh, we'll start with Adam. Um, <laughs> um, I spend too much time on city council. <laughs> um, um, no, realistically, I mean, so you didn't pay nearly enough to compete with a part-time job or certainly a full-time job. So you end up paying, you end up having to work full-time. Um, I work for a local nonprofit, um, work 40 hours a week. I do between, depending on the time of year, 20 to 40 hours a week on, on city council. Um, and that's what I plan to keep on doing because that's what I believe is the requisite amount of time to serve the way that I see fit. Um, that was the other question, what else do I sit on? Yeah, yeah, okay. Talk about the committees. That I you could spend 30 sit seconds. Um, yeah. So, on the city council, I chair both the public safety committee um, and the licensing and liquor control, liquor control committee. I've chair chaired the CDNR committee, which will waste too much time for me to read out loud. Um, I sit on a number of uh, boards, uh, nonprofit boards in town, uh, and I also sit, um, I sit on volunteer boards as, as well. I, go to my website, adamroof.com, to see the long list. Thanks. Thank you. Jane. All right, I'm gonna give you a little context because it's important to answer this question. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I ran two clubs, the Renewable Energy Network and the UVM Progressives. I even ran the Aikido Club for a little while. Um, I sat on the VPIRG board, which is our state's largest environmental and consumer advocacy board for two terms. I was a fellow for our climate, um, and I completed two degrees in four years. Now, to answer that question, though, I'm no longer running those clubs. I'm no longer in school. I am working, but I do have the time. Thank you, Jane. Zariah. Great, so I've obviously been an active member of my NPA. I sit on the Development Review Board, as I mentioned. I'm on the Planning Commission's Ordinance Committee. Um, I'm on the BTV Stakeholder Commission. Um, and I forgot the rest of the question. <laughs> so how much time are you gonna have to devote to council work? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, I recently changed my role at work, so now I'm working 80% time, one, and two, I no longer travel as much, so I am around and accessible, and I have the experience. Zariah, if I may, just as a, as a follow-up, um, how many city council meetings have you attended? Oh, sorry, yeah, and city council meetings, I haven't attended a whole lot. I watch a lot of them on, CCTV, um, but I've probably been to four. Thank you. Sharon. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, I'll be very brief, but I've been a city councilor for a long time, and so I have no idea how many city council meetings I've attended. Um, I can tell you that I've probably missed four in the 30 plus years that I've been on the city council. Um, and so I take this as a serious commitment to the people that have elected me to represent them. Um, I'm a member of the Board of Finance and the Ordinance Committee, but I also regularly attend 
uh, planning and DRB meetings, especially when they're items that are city issues or Ward 1 issues, and also Department of Public Works uh, Commission meetings. I'm there really representing you for the issues that matter. Um, I watchdog what's happening and make sure that um, I keep you informed and hopefully uh, bring your voice to the issues that matter for our ward. Thank you, Sharon. Jillian. I have plenty of time to devote to this. Um, I will say that after graduation, I will have to find another job um, if I want to continue to uh, live in the city. Um, in regards to meetings, I've attended, uh, attended many city council meetings, been to multiple MPAs, spoke in front of different commissions in front of the city, um, as well as gone to uh, Community Coalition, which is, happens at the university, which a group of students and a group of long-term residents come together each month to talk about the issues. Sophie, you're right here. She's an active member of that group. Um, in regards to experience and if I think I can be on City Council, um, as student body president right now at UVM, I serve a constituent base of over 10,000 students. Um, I hear their needs, I hear their concerns, and, and I work with them to, to see the action being made and to see that their expectations are being met. Um, and so I think that I can do the, very much the same for my neighbors in Ward 1. Jillian, thank you. All right, we have some questions from our audience here. So first one, and this one, Jane, you will answer first. Wards one and eight have significant student populations. How have you engaged with both students and permanent residents? Well, given my previous answer, I've engaged quite a lot with students uh, in the area. Um, but in terms of uh, residents, I I am very active in my community. I um, and and also my fellowship with our climate. I actually had to do a lot of uh, work with um, you know energy independent Vermont and a lot of people, a lot of leaders, local leaders in who live right here in Burlington in Ward Wards One and Eight um, to put on a, a, a very special event that happened uh, about a year and a half ago now as a forum, as a panel event about carbon pricing, and we had professors and we had students and we had um, local climate activists on that panel and it you know it, it took about three months to plan that but in that there's a lot of networking because of uh, a lot of the networks that I have here in Burlington itself so it kind of made it easy but um, yeah I do I do work with a lot of people as much as possible because that's all this is for <laughs> thank you Jane Soraya uh, yeah, so I have never been a student at UVM, but I interact with a lot of UVM students. I don't want to say it because my partner's in the crowd, but I used to date one. Um, and yeah, so definitely I feel like I've got the student, when I first moved here, I was working in, you know, my first job. And so a lot of my friend base is students, and I think I have a good understanding of what students are facing in the city. And then obviously I've been extremely involved in the community um, in terms of resident side, um, longer term um, folks, and on the development review board, I get to see the problems that those people face and has see people come before. Um, the DRB every two weeks and talk about housing changes that they want to see and like what specifically is impacting their exact home and trying to get um, yeah changes that they would like to see or permits and so on so I think I've got a pretty good understanding of both groups thank you Sharon thank you so um, as a city councilor I reach out to people that of any age that are in the ward. I'm a member of the Community Coalition. I actually was a long-term member of the Community Coalition and did the moving off campus workshops when they existed. Um, I'm also a community gardener, which brings me in, in uh, to interact with people from around the community. Um, at the hospital, I taught um, clinical laboratory science students that were from UVM. Um, I go to the NPA and I and occasionally when invited get to go to Fern Hill or Macaulay Square to find out what's on the minds of people living in those senior centers. Thank you. Thank you Sharon. Jillian. 
I won't spend too much time on the student piece, certain, because I spend too much time on my student piece already. Um, but I do feel like I have a good understanding of the needs of the students at the University of Vermont, because they're my current constituents. I and mean, I'm talking with them every day. Um, in regards to engaging with long-term residents, a lot of that work has happened from just living in the neighborhood and, and being around and, and going to community events. Um, I've really enjoyed in the past few weeks uh, while we've been out on the campaign trail. Um, my favorite thing is when I'm knocking, when I'm knocking a street, um, and in that street I see both I knock on student stores and young adult doors and uh, someone who's been retired and a longtime resident. Um, so I think that this question is really important for our ward is because there is such a mix of folks living there and we need to make sure we're finding ways that we're, that we're communicating well with all of them. Um, and I'm looking forward to doing that more as city councilor. Thank you. Adam. Sure. Um, this is a great question. Um, you know, Ward 8 was, came to be in 2015 and it was the first year that I ran and too often it was referred to as the student ward. And it's, it's not that. There are families and, and young professionals that live there as well. And so I've tried to focus on bridging the gap between student residents and more longer term residents and young professionals as well. And much like an answer I gave before, a lot of their needs are similar and overlap. So I've worked on things like community cleanups that both of those communities benefit from. We worked on increasing foot patrols paid for by UVM because we have, uh, we, we had, luckily it's, it's dipping, but we don't have a, as much of a burglary problem as we did in many, um, many years ago. And then on the, uh, you know, I believe that, you know, we need to bring more people into the democratic process in Ward 8, especially uh, with turnout being low at times, but I'm very proud to have brought over a thousand students and young people and otherwise into the political process over the five years that I've been in office. Thank you, Adam. Another question from our audience. Um, they're noticing a huge increase in graffiti. It seems to be a real problem, so wondering what ideas you may have to combat this. Zariah. I was not expecting that question. Um, I don't know. What do you do with graffiti? I guess paint over it, put some art. I don't, um, <laughs> I honestly don't have a good, obviously this is um, a, public safety issue. I think graffiti is often an art expression. I honestly have not noticed this in the ward. I wonder if I'm just blind to it having lived in bigger cities. Um, I am sorry to say I don't think I have a good answer to this. All right, Zara, thank you. Uh, Sharon. So I'm not certain in what sections of the city we're seeing an increase. Um, but we did have an episode of graffiti, and it's really hard to remove. We had a committee, actually, that used to go around and remove graffiti. But as Zariah stated, sometimes graffiti is actually art. So it's, it's, it's sensitive. And, but if somebody is, is doing that to a building that they don't own, um, then that's vandalism. And so, uh, so you have to balance all of that. The best thing to do is get people together, if you can find the person who did it, and, and, have, and have that come to a resolution. Um, and so uh, that is the most effective way to have the person that created the graffiti remove the graffiti and understand the impact it had on the property owner. Thank you, Sharon. Jillian. I also didn't quite expect this and don't quite know where in the city uh, which graffiti we're talking about. Um, I think that we've done a little bit of this in Burlington, but in a lot of other cities, in order to combat graffiti, um, they've had teams and collaborations go out, um, at least on like a lot of public places, whether that's like an electrical box or, a, or a, just an empty wall. They'll like paint something very collaborative and expressive of the community um, because people are less likely to graffiti over someone else's art. Um, I mean, I don't know if that's always the case. And again, I'm not sure which graffiti we're talking about. Um, but I think that that's a great opportunity for community building. But you know, we also get some beautiful art. Um, my my team has been um, laughing at me because the the mural on Chase Street. Um, I've made it like my computer background, my my phone. Like the minute I saw that, I just I just fell in love with it. Um, so I think seeing more of that in the neighborhoods would maybe combat any of the graffiti stuff. Thank you. Adam. <clears throat> um, I think there's different types of graffiti. Uh, there's graffiti that is at times offensive or damaging to, to property. Uh, then there's other types of graffiti, which is more of 
art-based, uh, I suppose you could say, and so I'll, I'll kind of address it in two different ways. First, we do have a position at DPW that is funded but unfilled, um, someone that r removes graffiti. Uh, what you need to remove graffiti is either paint or a power washer. It's not that complex, I've done both. Um, on the other side, and I think this is more of an, ins the, an inspired answer to the question, is let's invest more in the artists that are looking to express themselves in our community. Um, it can be done. Uh, our northern neighbor, the city of Montreal, has done an exceptional job with this. I, and next time you're up there, walk down, take the long walk down St. Laurent Street and look at all of the amazing public art that's done by what used to be graffiti artists. Uh, there is a balance to strike here between removing it and enforcing the, the damage side of things, but also let's invest in it and, and make it a part of our public art commitment. Thank you. Jane. This is going to be a dense answer, so try to stay with me. But this is a concern of someone in the in the crowd, so I you know I want to answer this as well as possible. But I think that offensive gra graffiti um, is a, is a representative of a larger issue, um, uh, maybe a mental health issue, um, which is another huge aspect of what I'm trying to focus on as a candidate across the city. And um, I think we could also bring in CEDO, uh, our uh, Community and Economic Development Office. And, you know, they, they are instated, they're here, but they could be doing a lot more and they could focus on inclu inclusion more and maybe that can, um, you know, encompass the uh, local artists and a lot of the characters that we have here in Burlington because, honestly, like graffiti can be a very positive thing. Um, but I, again, I'm not sure the specific piece that you're talking about, but offensive graffiti absolutely needs to be uh, addressed a ASAP. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to take one more question from the audience before uh, we get closing statements. Um, this question comes from Richard, and he says, I believe Burlington has a very large pension liability. How may we address this liability? Should the money from the sale of Burlington Telecom be applied toward this? Sharon. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> um, so I was part of a press conference earlier today speaking about taking the proceeds from Burlington Telecom and reinvesting it in the new BT because it would yield twelve and a half percent interest rate and we would have a constant revenue stream that could keep taxes down um, so but part of the proceeds are already going to paying out the retirement for the employees that were were city employees that now have gone to BT I'm not sure taking that money and and trying to deal with the the pension problem is the smartest thing to do. And I think I'd have to refer to the actuary and study it. I'm one that likes to get all the information before I make a decision, and this is a serious decision. Thanks for the question, though. Thanks, Sharon. Jillian. Um, I'll be honest and tell you that I don't know much about this pension fund problem that you're speaking to. Um, but if Richard wants to find me after this, I would love to learn more about it. Thank you. Adam. I mean, we can, <clears throat> so sort of two parts of the question, a little bit about pension liability and then whether or not using BT proceeds is a, a smart way to, to deal with uh, controlling for some of the, the difficulties with the, the fund. Um, we have, uh, as I understand it, the, uh, a board that works on pension liability that are professionals that are consistently looking at this, this, this large pension liability, which I believe the government does have a responsibility to do right by those who have worked for our community. Um, and they are consistently working on how to keep that uh, pension fund in line. I trust them on that. Um, I think we all should. On the issue of using Burlington Telecom sales to help offset some of the pension liability, I don't think that's a smart move. It's like spending your savings and expecting some sort of return on it. Um, if we invest those dollars, we have a b far better um, chance of returning uh, m money on an annual basis as opposed to uh, taking that money, putting it one time at an issue that really is something that's growing on an upward scale. I think that would be unwise. Thank you, Adam. Jane. I think at any opportunity possible, we should be investing in renewable energy here in, in the city, but also um, as a state. And I... 
I'm not too familiar with the pension fund thing either, but I also think that you know, our pension fund is currently invested in fossil fuels, and um, I think that that has something to be said about the current um, trend that we're in, and um, we, we really need to be investing in a really wise way moving forward, especially if we're going to meet our targets moving forward. Adam, you want to use your last rebuttal? Yeah, I think I do, because um, I, I, I mean, I take... I, I, I mean, I think to, to mitigate the, the pension fund to a pension fund thing is incredibly problematic. Uh, let me just reiterate, this pension fund, much like uh, much of the city budget and, and what we spend our dollars on are for taking care of people. Uh, that's through salaries and benefits. And one benefit that we've offered for a long time as a public institution, and we should be proud about this, are, uh, are our pension funds. And so this is a, a serious thing. And if we are changing how we invest in it, we need to make sure that we're not hurting people's pocketbooks because this is what they live on. Thank you, Adam. Zariah. Um, yes. So uh, I think pension liability is a global issue that's becoming more and more important as we have aging populations that are on average getting older, which is a good thing. Um, we do have to replan how we're going to pay for pensions. I don't think we're alone in this problem. I don't think I have the answer for it. I think that the sentiment of it doesn't make sense to apply this one um, one time like fund um, makes sense. I think it's about replanning, and I I haven't met the uh, team, but I assume that they are making a plan or thinking about that, and that we can be progressive about dealing with that. I do think that um, there is definitely a discussion that also needs to happen around um, divestment. Divestment is important in all facets of our investments, um, including uh, pension funds, which doesn't mean that there's not other cost competitive alternatives um, that can be invested in that aren't around uh, fossil fuels. Thank you. So based on the time, we've run out of time to ask more questions. Um, those que for after this particular event, the candidates will be here uh, hanging out so you can continue to ask more questions to them if you wish um, after this event. Um, right now, we're going to move to closing statements of the candidates. We're going to start with Jillian. Uh, thank you. Uh, we need bold new action that addresses the current climate crisis, affordable housing, and the real needs of the neighbors in our communities. Uh, Ward 1 needs a counselor who will propose creative and realistic solutions to problems. Um, and what, you're, what you know that you'll get with me um, is that I can promise you that as counselor, I'll, you can hold me to the values that are listed above me. Thank you, YMCA. Those values of being caring, honest, having respect, and being responsible. Um, as student body president at UVM, I've proven time and time again that I have the skills to set these tangible goals and achieve them, um, and hear the needs of my constituents, and, and see action make action be seen. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, to talking more with you tonight. And I really appreciate you all coming out to this. Um, it's really you know, wonderful to see, to see all of your faces. So thank you. Thank you. Adam. Yeah, also thank you for, for being here. Um, you know, if, if anyone that knows me, you know that I'm a lover of public policy. Uh, sometimes a little bit too much. People laugh at me sometimes. I see a few in the crowd who, who know that I love this. Um, and because I'm a believer that it can change communities and transform people's lives, I've seen it happen and I've done it. Um, but for these remarks, I instead want to talk a little bit about uh, who I am and what guides me, because uh, I don't talk about that enough. And I'm a middle child, uh, born to two of the most amazing people I've ever met, and my parents worked for me and my siblings to give us the opportunities that they never had, and they succeeded. In 2011, I graduated first in my family from the University of Vermont. And while there, while I didn't come from a political family, I became inspired by Barack Obama's message of hope and change. And it's still what drives me today. Um, I don't have a lot of time left, but I'll close with, with this, because it's, it's important to, to think of who you're voting for. Because at the local level, you have the option to do that. It's not a lesser of two evils thing. Uh, I'm someone that's guided by the values of which I was raised, which is to help lift others up, push back against those that work to tear you down, and above all else, work to leave this world a little better than the way that you found it. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Jane. I would not be running for city council if I thought that the current leadership was taking these incredibly time-sensitive issues seriously. We are in a climate emergency. 
and I can't stress that enough. We are in an emergency that is time sensitive and terrifying. And I can speak for not just my generation or you know, college students. Like this, this, is a, this is a cross-generational issue that we're all gonna be dealing with, all of our families, everyone we know. And I want to build a very strong coalition to actually address these pressing issues. And I am willing to do the outreach and the, the homework and the groundwork way ahead of time before we propose anything and actually knock on the doors of those that are going to be um, af affected and impacted by anything being proposed from city council. I, you will see my face. <laughs> like I, I love to talk to people and that is, that is this job. And um, you know I, I want to make decisions with the community and not just for it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. Zariah. I think that our housing and our transportation is getting worse, not better. Our transportation climate emissions are going up. Our housing stock is getting worse. And we're going to need different ideas to change that. We can't depend on the solutions that we've been trying to do because they're not working. They are just not working. And I don't speak in platitudes. I'm not going to make but I've dealt with housing insecurity. I'm an environmentalist by trade. I am running on housing and transit because I know housing and transit, and I know that I can pass policies, pragmatic, everyday policies that will make a difference. So that's why I'm excited to run. Um, yep. Thank you, Zariah. Sharon. Thank you. Although I've been your representative for quite a while, it doesn't mean that I have uh, exhausted all of my ideas. I haven't. And I'm up for the challenge. I like working with people, uh, multi-generational. I've always gravitated towards younger and newer uh, city councilors and uh, proposed legislation with them. I'm sorry, I'm close. Um, I think the environment is really critical. I've come forward with a couple of initiatives with one with getting away from fossil fuel and going to electrification for heating and cooling and new development. I also uh, think a key issue in Burlington is affordability and have put forward um, supported with the wa with the wastewater bond the fact that we'd have a tiered water rate system so water would be more affordable for you all. Look forward to that this spring. Thank you very much. I ask for your support in March. Thank you, Sharon. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Really appreciate your respectful attendance tonight as so we get through as many questions as possible. But again, let me start first by let's give these, uh, these counselors and these uh, incumbents a round of applause. Thank you. And again, I want to uh, say thank you again to ARP Vermont and to the Burlington Business Association for putting this on because elections are the most important thing we participate in and having this type of information and informing the electorate is one of the most important things that they continue to do for us. So again, our, my appreciation and I believe it's all of our appreciation for that. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Kelly Devine from the Burlington Business Association. How about a round of applause for our moderator, Marcus Serta? Thank you. So very grateful for our partnership with AARP. Grateful to you all who came out. Uh, we want to try to help and vote inform voters about the issues that are important to our organizations, the shared issues. Uh, the election is on March 3rd. You can also vote early at City Hall. The polling place for Ward 1 is the Margaret Christie School. The polling place for Ward 8 is the Fletcher Free Library. Uh, we have same day registration in Burlington. So uh, we wanna make sure that you get out and vote and get informed in advance and uh, that we can get our democracy working really strongly in this upcoming March election because it is really important because it does help to set the agenda for the future of the city. Please stay around and join us. Uh, I hope the candidates will stay as well and you can have a conversation with them. We have some coffee and some snacks and um, we apologize for not being able to get to everyone's questions but thank you all for submitting them and we will at least offer them up to the candidates for their consideration as the campaign moves forward. So thank you.